Hello everybody, uh, thanks for joining us. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn. I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com, uh, which is an array of services, information, events, and so on uh, for people who work in and around the global medcoms community, by which I mean medical communications, medical education, medical publishing. Um, and we're running these Zoom meetings as a great way of extending our reach and involving more people from all over the world. Um, so today, um, great to have John with us, um, a scientific uh, writer and trainer, and we're going to talk about uh, running virtual workshops. Um, and what we're going to do today is we're going to have a presentation, we're going to have a Q&A session, and all being well, we'll record, uh, we'll record that, and the recordings will later on be on Network Pharma TV. So um, on that note, John, uh, can I hand over to you? Sure. Can I share my screen? Okay. Uh, and can you see my screen, Peter? I can. That's great. Great. Okay. Well, uh, good. Uh, well, good lunchtime, everybody, depending on where you are, of course, either morning, or afternoon, but uh, hello. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Peter very much for inviting me to talk today on a, a topic which is, uh, well, I'm passionate about, but it's also what I do. Um, I've got around about 20 slides. It should take me around about 20 minutes. Uh, and then obviously we'll be happy to uh, discuss and take questions afterwards. Uh, and as Peter says, uh, pop comments in the comments box or questions if you want to. Um, so I've been providing face-to-face -face workshops in scientific writing and presentation skills since 2013. Um, uh, and I say face-to-face -face there. It's, uh, my, my audience is, is, is generally university doctoral students, uh, medical writers, prospective medical writers and occasional workshops with uh, postdocs, other research institutes uh, and, and indeed account managers in agencies. Since the beginning of last year, um, I've also started to give or uh, provide virtual workshops, um, but there was no pressing immediate urge and, and because uh, you know, it's generally uh, more fun and the thing I've been doing to give face to face, it, it, it is not something that uh, I did a huge number of last year, but of course, as we know now, uh, things have changed. And so really over the past two or three months, um, uh, all my workshops have, have been virtual. So and by my experience, I've been using the Zoom platform, which everybody's heard of, many people use, but not everybody uses it. Um, but I am going to refer to my experience with Zoom and sort of technical aspects of using Zoom. But of course, clearly some people will be using MS Teams, GoToMeeting, GoToWebinar, Skype, Cisco, WebEx, uh, and so on. So. Uh, first of all, what is a webinar and what is a workshop? What is e-learning? I think it's quite interesting to sort of just differentiate the three. Um, a webinar is, like we are today, is generally more of a one-way process. Uh, yes, we're going to get some questions and participation later, but it's a one-way process. Usually people going into a webinar, they don't need preparation, they don't need handouts and documents beforehand. Um, whereas we need to compare that with a virtual workshop, which is what I'm talking about. And the critical thing about this uh, is that this is more of a two-way process. Um, in fact, you could almost argue that a great workshop is a three-way process. It's not only is, is information from a trainer to participants, but it's from participants are able to uh, interact with the trainer, but indeed they're able to interact and indeed encouraged to interact with themselves as well. In fact, an interesting um, uh, another way of looking at it is, is another way of describing it is, is uh, a virtual instructor led live training, uh, which introduces the concept that actually you are there is human to human interaction uh, and also that it is live. Uh, and this contrasts with e-learning, uh, which is usually something which can be accessed 24 seven and doesn't have immediate human to human interaction. But the big challenge and the challenge I found, I'm sure the challenge everybody's going to find is, is trying to make a, a workshop a two way and enjoyable experience as opposed to just a one way traffic of information. And that for me has been the challenge. Uh, and, and indeed, I have to say this is still work in progress for me, but I'd like to share some of my experiences with you. So I'll go through a little bit about what participants say uh, about what I've been delivering uh, over the past, certainly last year. And I've taken uh, comments, relevant comments from feedback surveys that I've given, and I've tried to work on those to, to improve what I deliver. How does it feel to deliver a virtual workshop? Um, a little bit about preparation, the workshop resources, uh, what can you fit into a program? 
we need to talk about technology because clearly that's a very important uh, part of this. Uh, and then interaction, you know, how do we interact? And, and, and then, uh, you know, what, 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 what are participants doing? You know, uh, we, we must remember that we're not just, just giving participants that they're maybe struggling with their IT or, or whatever. So what do participants say? Um, these are some selected comments, but they, 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 they're really just to encapsulate the, the sort of feedback I was getting last year, which has allowed me to sort of think hard about where we go with virtual workshops. Um, so if we just take these comments, well, it can be fun. Uh, fun and interactive, seeing all 16 people on the workshop, which of course is great. That's exactly what uh, we all want to hear. Um, the interactive parts work well when John, that's me, lets us know how to reply to an exercise or when asking a question, and that's incredibly important. Um, people enjoy being able to use both the comments box without interrupting the speaker, which of course is, is rather unique. That's different from face-to-face. -face. You have an alternative means of communicating, uh, which can be quite useful for the, the shy, and there are shy people out there. Uh, of course, people can uh, network and join in from wherever. I did a couple of workshops over the last two days. I had somebody from San Francisco. Um, he was a bit sleepy, uh, but, you know, great that he could actually join in. Um, and another thing is it was good to be able to hear John clearly. Uh, and I think that's very important for the, for the trainer is that they have great uh, microphone. And, and, uh, uh, and I've learned from that instead of just using a an array microphone, I've actually now use a reasonable headset and I hope that people can hear me clearly. Dislikes, what do people not like? Um, or, or Well, if people are unsure as to how to communicate at different times, whether do they raise a hand, a proper hand, do they raise a virtual hand, uh, do they unmute and speak, uh, you know, that, that can be quite, quite disturbing. So people need to be very clear about what they do and when. Um, if people are going to tune in for one, two, three hours, and indeed if they're, you know, if they're going to pay some money uh, for, for a service, they really do need to know what's involved. If you go to a face-to-face -face workshop, then for free you get to see people, talk to people, interact with people, and that of course is part of the fun. In a virtual workshop, um, you really, I get the impression that people really do, do want to know exactly what it is that they're letting themselves in for. Uh, so it starts to emphasize the, 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 sort of the communication and preparation before a workshop it needs to be particularly good. Um, I felt a bit shy compared with the lecture theater conference environment. Uh, those of you who give workshops uh, know that, that, you know, the best workshops are when people uh, politely you know, interrupt, argue, contribute, and you, you, you can get a real buzz out of that. But there will always be people in a workshop who don't say anything. Um, and of course, there's a natural shyness, and that is, that is understandable, and people feel, feel vulnerable. But I think that's also the case in virtual workshops, maybe also a, a maybe increased inhibition to, you know, your, the video is on you, you know, that you're, you're being, you know, maybe your thumbnail is even being uh, enlarged uh, or, or, or framed. So people do feel a bit vulnerable. And so part of the challenge is to get over that shyness, try and get people to relax and, and, and enjoy. I, of course, I missed the informal side of a normal workshop. Uh, yes, of course, it's never going to be quite the same, but as we are at the moment, we need to make the best of it. What do people suggest? Um, people suggest, uh, therefore, logically, you know, people need to be very clear about what they do and when they do it to interact. And that's a, 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 an incredibly important message. Um, and then a couple of similar messages. Uh, participants have asked for tips on formatting Zoom screens. You know, where do I get put my boxes? Uh, where do I, how do I grapple with my notes at the same time? Um, and, and, and just troubleshooting, getting these all in the right place uh, at the right time. Uh, you know, where, it, where is my chat box? Uh, so how does it feel? How does it feel to give a virtual workshop? Well, let's all start with the good. It can work well and it can feel good. Um, and, and I've certainly uh, been times when we've got into a workshop and people start to realize that I'm, you know, not a, a, a giant ogre and that, you know, we can chat and people can interrupt. Um, you can actually enjoy it. You, know, you can relax and enjoy it and, 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 and almost forget that you're in the virtual environment. So it can work well, but, it's intense. 
uh, as a workshop leader or as a as a, a trainer, you're not just concentrating on delivering you, your information and, and and hopefully sharing your expertise, uh, but you've also got to cope with the tech and the IT and everything else which will come on to. It's intense and therefore it's it's tiring, probably more tiring. Um, it's distracting. Uh, if something happens or something goes wrong, um, you're having to multitask. Um, there are periods of frustration uh, if you know if you're hoping for some sort of interaction and nothing happens. Sometimes you think, well, ooh, can they still hear me? Um, you know, almost feel like saying, please raise your hand if you can still hear me. Uh, so it can be frustrating uh, from time to time, and you do feel vulnerable because if something does go wrong and you're the the the, the sole the sole trainer or the uh, going solo, as it were, without a co-host, you are vulnerable because if something happens or if suddenly you lose your connection, well, you've got to do something about it. So is it a piece of cake or is it quite a challenge? Well, I would say that really uh, it is quite a challenge, uh, uh, but it is possible. You know, you can do a lot with it and it can be enjoyable. Preparation and, and, and the resources uh, and giving people resources uh, is important. And of course, it's important for any workshop. Um, but again, the, the, the comments that I've had sort of um, uh, really exaggerate the fact that, that, that people need to be very clear about what it is that they're letting themselves in for and very clear about what they're being given and when they should be using various documents. You know, there are no paper handouts anymore. Um, so, first of all, the registration process, um, and, and we do need to mention the word security as well, of course, there's been a lot of um, talk, really sort of maybe not so much talk now, but certainly three or four weeks ago, there's a lot of uh, twittering about Zoom security and Zoom have uh, tried to do something about it. Uh, but, but, but a registration process is important for security. Uh, you know, Zoom bombers are not particularly welcome, although I've never seen one as yet. Um, so you need to have, you know, good email list maybe, so that if you drop out, as a trainer, you can actually email everybody and say, hey, I'm still here and I'm still trying to get back in again. So the registration process is important, but also that, the, you know, everything is E. Uh, and so you may well be handing out more E documents, you know, PDFs, guides. Uh, and so, it, you know, an initial email explaining exactly what's happening, what documents people should get. You know, if you give people seven or eight documents and that runs off the bottom of the attachment screen in Outlook, you know, people think, well, there are only four here and you know, I've been told I'm getting eight. So you have to be very wary about that. And so the initial email has to be clear, plus, plus you know, everything else in sequence and, and people are very clear as to, as to uh, what they're using and when they're using it. Um, the program, can you just take a workshop you know, can I just take or was I able to just take a day's workshop and just deliver it virtually? I think not. Um, yes, of course, it forms the basis and, and probably 80, 90 percent of it forms the basis of what you do. But I don't think you can get as much into the same time in a virtual workshop. Um, you have to spend a bit more time at the beginning of a workshop, just making sure people are clear about the interface, um, about setting up about technical problems and about how to interact. So I think the introduction is always going to take a bit longer, plus your icebreaker, you know, an icebreaker is important. So um, you're already beginning to shrink down the amount of time and, and, and I'll come on to it. I think you, you know, people do need probably a little bit more of a, of a break or two breaks. Or is it three breaks? Um, I, I, I don't think people can cope with a full seven hours workshop in one day in front of a screen. I think it's too much. And most of the people I've spoken with, and certainly colleagues that I work with in the European Medical Writers Association, uh, you know, and I, and, and I have many colleagues who give workshops, we really feel that the, the half day workshop virtually is an absolute max that people can take in any one time. So my one day workshop will always be a couple of half days now. Uh, well, I've, I've, I've found that people are not particularly worried about the half day, um, but certainly one day I think would be too much. I hate afternoons, you know, I hate, falling asleep after lunch and, and I think many people also feel a bit sleepy after lunch but that's a personal preference. Breaks are important. Um, I usually use at least two breaks, sometimes three. Sometimes I have a sort of a three or four minute break after one hour, 10 to 15 minutes for coffee after two and then another short break maybe five minutes after two and three quarter. And again people haven't complained about that and many people have actually said to me that the that that actually breaks things up quite nicely so the breaks are quite important but again you see this is sort of cutting into your time maybe as to what you can actually fit in in the time 
Um, the icebreaker is essential. I mentioned the word shy. Uh, and I think the icebreaker is, 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 is necessary. Of course, for all workshops, you need an icebreaker to start off with. I try and get everybody to unmute and say something at the beginning of a workshop. Uh, if you've got, say, 20 people in, uh, and I would say probably 20 is a, just about a maximum for a decent workshop. Um, so the icebreaker is not only to get people to, to just work out how, how, to, you know, how to unmute uh, or how to raise a hand electronically, uh, but also to give them encouragement to just say something um, and, and just to start to feel a little bit more relaxed about, about interacting. Technology, critical, obviously. Um, and you've got to think about not only the technology, my expertise, our expertise as trainers and hosts, but also the technological expertise of your participants as well. Although people are getting better as time goes on, obviously. So um, I'm talking about solo hosting here. Um, you know, clearly there's a resource implication if you're going to have somebody else sitting with you for three and a half hours who's there as a backup. So my experience has been solo hosting and I think if it, if it can work solo, it can certainly work if you have somebody alongside you. Um, but therefore you do need to be competent. You do need to be very familiar with, with, with how, you know, you're, whether it's Zoom screens or whatever, uh, and what to do if, if something does go wrong or, uh, or whatever, or somebody asks you a techie question. Uh, so screen setup's important, um, you know, how many screens, where do you put your windows, uh, make sure that you're actually facing the camera rather than somewhere else. Lighting positioning, and you know, we've all seen, uh, you know, the lighting from behind where, you know, you can't see who's actually talking. Um, oh, well, the lighting not quite right, you know, or, or yes, but I've got two screens and the trainer's actually talking to a different screen. So, you know, we need to be, be putting on a reasonably professional front, which, which, you know, which is to face the screen and have good lighting. Um, so, so, and obviously lighting from behind is not a great idea. It's lighting from the front. Uh, which is reasonable. And I uh, may be an overkill now, but I, I actually have three screens. There's my setup. That's exactly where I am at the moment. Um, comfortable three screens and it, and, and it gives me the flexibility to open documents and to have windows in different places. And the lighting, as you can see, is, is actually facing me. But you need to think about participants as well. Um, uh, and so uh, I, I've learned from people wanting to know about screen setup and everything. And I actually, for my own benefit, I actually wrote a kind of guide, which I give to all my participants uh, from the very basic about security and participation through to a little bit more of the techie stuff about how they can set up screens uh, and windows and everything. Um, because you need to remember that most people are probably only on one screen. Some people are only even on an iPhone. Um, you know, how people multitask on an iPhone in a workshop, I have no idea, but, you know, people do nowadays. It's maybe my age shows me that, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I can't cope in the same way that um, perhaps slightly younger people can. Uh, but you have to, you know, you have to assume that people are only working sometimes on one screen. And if they've got three or four PDFs and a chat window uh, and, and, and multiple um, uh, video images of people and the shared screen, that's a lot of stuff going on. Okay, so don't forget the participants and being able to help them if you can. Uh, we should mention security. Um, it's clearly it's important. Um, I, I use Zoom. Zoom have, have upped their game. Um, that, that they introduce a password protection or the password is now encrypted into the URL that you're given, which is good. Um, I always use the waiting room uh, in Zoom, which means that people can't actually get into the meeting unless I recognize their name. Hence, the, 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 you need a name list and an email list as well to make sure that you know who's coming in, except that if people don't call themselves by their own names, that can be a problem, but I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, Zoom also introduces the lock room, which means that after, say, 20 minutes, you can lock the room so that people, nobody can get in. Problem is that people drop out because of maybe IT problems or whatever, and then the problem is they've got to get back in again and that becomes a nightmare because they can't get back in. So they need to text their friends or send you an email and then you need to open up, unlock the room and let them in. Hey, you're trying to deliver a workshop at the same time. Uh, so I'm not so certain about the, the lock room, but clearly it's, you know, it's a good security point if you do, do need to use it. The other interesting thing about the, uh, the, 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 the virtual workshop is it actually is, lends itself more to providing uh, resources for uh, 
participants. Um, actually, you know, if I want to pull up a PDF and I can slide it across to my shared window, I can do. Uh, I can put up a link onto the chat window and people can follow the link to a website. I can show a website um, or I can, I can ask them to download a document from my own PC. It's actually really very easy and very flexible to, to use resources there, which is, which is actually really quite nice. And then, of course, there's disaster planning. Um, I, 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 I would suggest that, you know, unless you've got an absolutely, is there ever an absolutely reliable wireless connection? Um, I use, I'm wired with an Ethernet to my router. Um, that's not going to be perfect, but it, it, it's possibly less, less prone to uh, hiccups. Um, but I do have a backup system um, and I, in fact, I, I check it every time before a workshop uh, because immediately if I go down and I go on to 4G and I plug my phone back into my PC and then I can use 4G rather than my, my wireless and hope that my PC is working and I've got a laptop in case my PC doesn't work because if it all goes down, you know, you, you, you've got to do something about it. Um, you have to have these things. Of course, if you have a co-host, then it's great somebody could take over immediately, but that has resource implications. Or do you have just somebody available? Phone a friend, you know, a technical friend. Please, can you help me? Can you log back into the meeting and, and keep people occupied, you know, until I get back in again? So you do need to have some sort of insurance policy there. Uh, interaction. It's the essence of a virtual workshop. Uh, in Zoom, and there are many other workshops, you know, of course you have the unmute and speak, and actually that's what I tend to tell people to do is, unless I say otherwise, just unmute and talk, which is exactly the same as people will do in a workshop, and that for me actually works best. Um, but there is the chat window, um, then I need to keep my eye both on what I'm doing here and the chat window, uh, which does work as long as I'm able to multitask. But some people do find it very helpful because they can put their comments in, they can share comments with other participants. Uh, maybe I can pick them up later or if I notice them, I can pick them up immediately. Um, the raise hand, raise the electronic hand, or, or you could even say raise a, raise a normal hand. But you've got to be watching out for these things. And certainly the zoom blue hand is actually quite small, uh, both in the, in the, in the thumbnail image uh, or in the participant list image uh, images. Um, there's the yes and no, which is quite useful. Um, you know, the, the, I, I think this is true. Say yes or no, whether you agree or not. Of course, that's a very quick way to get a poll. And that's actually really quite useful. Um, then you've got the polling, which we saw uh, just at the beginning of this, uh, before we started recording, which is actually quite nice to get a feel as to, uh, and anonymously get a feel as to what people think about something. Um, Breakout rooms uh, are a, 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 a very important part of it. And of course, this is where you can send people off in groups of two, three, and four to brainstorm and then bring people back into the meeting. I would say that most people love it. Um, maybe at the moment they actually love it because when they, they escape from the, the trainer, they can actually have a chat about you know, the weather and, and whether they've gone outside and, and, and you know, you know what's, what's the latest film they've been watching. But obviously, you know, you give them a task to do as well. Uh, I'm still working on breakout rooms. I've had people say you left us out there too long. Some people say that you left us out there without enough time. So it's getting the balance, but at least people got the opportunity for, as I say, the three-way interaction. That's interaction with themselves, uh, which I think most people uh, enjoy. Uh, and that is a very different dynamic and you, know, you can let your hair down even more and actually relax and chat with, with, with colleagues and brainstorm something. Um, so these essential, there are many options, but the important thing is you've got to be very clear to people as to what they do and when they do it. Participant behaviour. So what are people doing? What's going on at the same time as I'm trying to deliver the information? Problem is that people have do have trouble logging on um, and, and then getting themselves set up. And so that's a little bit distracting at the beginning and you have to set time aside to help people with that. But during the workshop, you know, people will drop out uh, and then they've got to come back in again. Uh, so if you've got the waiting room is on, then you have to keep an eye and you'll you hopefully hear there's the sort of the Zoom bell, which people are knocking on the, on the waiting room door to get in. But it, equally, people will give you texts and emails. And I do, I do actually give people my email address and my, my mobile number so that they can say, I'm sorry, I'm having technical problems. Um, can you let me back in again? So, and, and this is inevitable. It is distracting and you have to accept it, but you, but you do get, you need, you need to, uh, to get used to that. Um, as I say, some people, unfortunately, uh, 
have trouble or haven't identified themselves. So I had somebody trying to get into a, a workshop calling themselves iPhone. Uh, who is iPhone? Um, you know, obviously you, you don't know. Um, I suspect that iPhone probably was a genuine person. And indeed they were. Um, but people, if they're coming in on an iPhone, can actually name themselves on the iPhone. And who was sexy screen? Um, actually, it happened to be my son who was trying to come into a work to a not a workshop, but a, a family meeting. But hey, same problems. You know, you you actually need to to be identifiable in a reasonable way. Um, another thing I found is that that uh, I, I did a workshop about a month ago, and uh, it, 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 three or four participants initially turned their videos off. Uh, one said, "I'm having a wave band problems," uh, and 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 so I, I I'm I just want my my sound on because I want to hear. Uh, and so, in fact, everybody else followed suit. Everybody else decided that they probably well, if he's not showing himself, then I won't. And I had sixteen blank screens, um, you know, just icons. And I found myself talking to, if you like, a sort of black wall for you know, three hours. And that was actually quite off-putting. You do need somebody to actually talk to. Um, so I do try and encourage people to, to keep the videos on. If somebody's shy and they, they do feel vulnerable or they're anxious, of course, they, they, you know, they're welcome to, 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 to not have their video on. Um, but it is, it, the, whole, the whole essence is that people do like to see other people. And, and you can see people's body language and you can, you can actually, you know, you can, you can judge people. If people smile, it's great. You know, if people are frowning or if they're looking like that, then, then you know that something may be up. Um, so, so uh, again, that's something which I've found is, uh, is, 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 is it's, it's nice if most people can be on, on video. Finally, um, you know, we all need our, 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 our uh, feedback and I take feedback very seriously. Of course, in a face-to-face -face workshop, if you lock the room, then you'll get 100% feedback. Uh, although even then people try and slip out without giving you their feedback form. Um, I give people a, a URL in their uh, in the chat window to a, a anonymous google form uh, and and i follow that up with an email i, I tend to get about 75 percent feedback which is which is pretty good you know it's acceptable um but it's important to get the feedback and i'm done uh i'm welcome any questions but thanks for listening uh I, i'm sure people have got other experiences of both um participating in workshops some of you who clearly have given workshops um, it's for me it's still work in progress uh, it's a fascinating challenge um, but it's where we are at at the moment and I think it's where we are going to be at for some considerable time to come if not life will always consist of more uh, virtual workshops than we ever had before so thanks again Peter for having me along and, and I really open things up to, uh, to questions and discussion Fantastic. Thanks, John. Can we lose the slide? Uh, we can um, indeed lose the slide, yeah. And um, what we'll now do is have a, a 10 minutes or so of Q&A. Um, I, I hope people appreciate it. I'm sure they do. That was packed full of very practical uh, information and tips. Um, one of the things I found fascinating, and let, full disclosure here, I mean, John and I have played with Zoom for, what, 18 months, probably longer. Um, the first time we trialled a workshop was probably a good year ago. Um, we run, or, or John runs some workshops for me, full-day workshops for people who want to be writers and so on. Um, there's a lot of, a lot. I know, John, you've put a lot of effort into this and a lot of <coughs> thought into it. Um, but also there's been quite a lot of practice and messing around in the background to, to do it. Um, one of the things that's um, always surprised me, always surprised me, it surprised me since that first trial we ran a year or so ago, is actually how well this, this can work. Um, but there are a lot of practical issues you need to sort through. So um, we're getting a number of questions and, and, and comments in. Uh, just a reminder to those of you online, you've got two boxes. Basically, at, at the bottom of your screen, you've got a chat button and a Q&A button. If you, um, if you use either of those to send in your questions and comments, then we can pick them up at this end and, um, uh, and, and weave them into the, uh, the conversation, as it were. Um, but um, just, just while I'm thinking about that, just let's talk about the, the whole video side of it, which is where you sort of ended up at the end. I think this is really quite interesting. You made the point, but let's just, let's just revisit slightly. Um, when you're running, a, a, not a webinar like today, but a, a workshop, um, people turning off their videos and so on can be very challenging. And you said, like, it's nice to have someone to talk to. But it's, it's that sort of, you know, if you can't see them, you can't work with them, you can't, put, you can't, you can't see their body language and all the rest of it. Um, how many, t I don't think you actually said it, but it might be worth saying. Um, but how many times does it come up when you've got a group and someone's a little bit shy or something because people don't like to be on video? Do, do you suggest that they go on, uh, there's a box that you can tick that's effectively hiding yourself 
So you're not hiding, you're not stopping your video, but you're not looking at yourself, which is what some people find a bit off-putting. Have you, have you got any experience of that or have suggested that to people? So that's for me, Peter, yeah? Uh, yeah, I'm directing that one at you, yeah. So, so okay, so um, the, the, I think taking it actually into, into one of the questions that actually, uh, I, I'm just looking down the question list now. Um, I, 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 at the outset, I, I actually, I'm trying to just be open and, and almost sort of say, look, um, I, I, you know, appreciate that, you know, people, some people may not want their videos on, uh, but it, it, I can assure you that everybody, it, people love to see other people. Uh, for me, it's very important. I think I deliver a better workshop when I can actually see people and read people's body language. Um, so, so I, 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 I simply just say, you know, so please do, do keep your videos on if, you, if at all you can. Uh, clearly, if you are having technical problems and, and connection problems, then I, I understand if you have to, to at least get rid of the video side of it and, and keep the sound on. Um, that, that, and when I've actually done that, because when I've learnt that people can get into sort of a, almost like groupthink mode of t everybody turns off. If I come out with that right at the beginning, that hasn't worked and I've had, you know, sort of 75 to 80 percent of people, there will always be one or two people who don't turn the videos on. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't push it any further. I simply say those of you who haven't, are you having any technical problems? Uh, if you have, then please let me know. Send me a private chat. You know, in the chat window, you can send a private message. Uh, just tell me what's happening. And I did actually once have exactly that i had a private message and, and, and from one person who simply said uh, i'm actually feeling very anxious at the moment do you mind if i keep my video off and i sent a private message back saying no problem at all yeah uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different dimension isn't it it's, it's interesting because you can we can all sit around a table and talk to each other and not think about it but on video there's something about being on camera and so on which um, which can 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 cause some some unsettlement and Tra trace has actually just said which is fair point if you if you if you if you do the self-hide thing you don't know what's going on behind you so you can you know your kids could be running around behind you you don't actually know about that so there's there's again there's practical stuff like that but i think you know it's it, 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 it threw me the first time i ran a sort of lunch and learn um having been ex uh, used to people coming in on video and then I ran a lunch and learn and, and half the people weren't on video and it's much much harder to work the work the room as it were and to talk to people and um, and, and get their input and so on so I, I suppose my message to anybody from my experience is you know run run one yourself as it were and see and then next time you're, you're in someone else's workshop you know just just try and put that video on I think it's useful um, we've got quite a few quite specific questions coming in we have. which I'm going to just be a little bit careful of um, but there's there's some questions there was a question around here about um, template, uh, well, templates, work mats. Um, do you have any top tips? How to use templates, work mats, whiteboards, things like that? How much experience have you got of those sorts of things? Um, well, I, 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 I mean, within Zoom, you you can use the whiteboard. Mm. Um, I, I've I've not gone for that. I mean, I you can also. I mean, I've also seen demonstrated a um, a shared Google Doc, which you know everybody can go to and you can actually show that on 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 screen so people can contribute uh, which i think is, is is great in certain brainstorming situations probably probably more when you're actually in a rather more closed uh, sort of um, agency marketing environment really uh, but uh, but i think for sort of educational workshops it, it can get rather confusing and fragmented if you're sharing a, a google doc or, or or a whiteboard I, I i'm sure some people use it quite successfully but i haven't actually resorted to doing that as yet but those facilities are certainly available i think again a comment from my side is that there are some of these tools available some of them are fine if you're if you're in a slightly more informal setting you can play around but you, you i mean one of the things you've emphasized you're talking as a sole trainer um it can be quite that there are quite a few things going on and they, that can go wrong so again, I think if you're, if you're a sole trainer running a workshop, uh, would you agree it's quite important to probably keep it quite simple um, because that minimizes the risk of things going wrong sort of thing, yeah? Um, that's a, whereas if you've got a group and you're having a business meeting or team meeting or something like that, you can play a little bit more um, and, and people are a bit more relaxed about it anyway. And um, just to cover up, I'm just gonna flick through a couple of these questions, John, uh, quite quickly. <coughs> Um, I'm quite, quite happy to go th down them as well, Peter, because there, there's some quick answers here. Uh, uh, but yeah, you go down them. And yeah, I'll... Let's, just, let's just pick some of these. So, um, and let's just be clear on this. So we, um, you've mentioned that your experience is mostly with Zoom and, and a lot of what you've said practically is with Zoom. Um, have you got any experience of working with other platforms, someone's asking? Um, I, I, you know, I think we should be clear. You Basically, you've used Zoom, haven't you? So 
yeah, honest answer, no. Uh, I mean, as a participant, uh, I've you know I've used what other platforms people have uh, have launched their um, their webinars on, but no, I I, I cannot speak for. I mean, I, I actually, interestingly, my you know my kids, uh, they're, they're they're very much involved in in giving uh, you know webinars and so on. So I, I I I'm it's interesting. I do compare and contrast notes with with them as they've given. Um, educational workshops or, or whatever using uh, GoToWebinar, uh, Cisco WebEx. Uh, the comment is usually is they're okay but actually we prefer Zoom. I'm not, I have no, obviously no commercial interest in Zoom but I, I think the tendency is that Zoom just works, it's, it's, it is very flexible. Um, certainly my family experience if you like is that they, they prefer the Zoom interface but um, but I think all the other platforms you'll provide a, a whole variety of uh, uh, facilities and many, many of the course are, are, are pretty similar. Okay, and Zoom is being used a lot. So uh, that was a little bit of a preempt to the next because uh, there's lots of questions just about Zoom specifically. And I don't yes, of course. Food, but, uh, but let's just cover off a few of these. Yes. Then um, why not? Um, what's your impression of using Zoom virtual backgrounds for presenters and participants? Do you do you find them useful or distracting or? Uh, I, I well, they 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 can be great. I mean, it's it's a bit like when PowerPoint came out twenty five years ago. We just loved actually making everything zoom around. Um, whereas actually, um, it, in fact, with a green screen, and if it, if you don't have, you see, you see, I've got actually a chair up here. I like a high back chair, and that really messes up a green screen. If you're actually in a low back chair, then a green screen or a virtual background can work really well, and you can actually have some really nice backgrounds which you can design yourself. Um, and certainly, if you've got a cluttered room or you you really don't want people to see what's happening behind you then of course it's a very good thing um, personally I, I've just decided it's, it's actually my chair that has made me just just go for just a hopefully reasonably tidy uh, you know back office and, and try not to get too many people walking through yeah, but uh, okay, cool okay but, so well, I, my, my, my comment um, backgrounds can be very distracting and people can be playing and I think if I was running a workshop I certainly wouldn't want to, to be playing and then distracting the background and if you don't get it quite right it can be quite distracting so I think it's fun I think if, you, if you're running a workshop particularly you want to be a bit careful with your background and make sure it doesn't distract from what you're trying to do sure. um, there was a, there's a couple of comments or in fact I think there might be several comments about um, uh, breakout rooms and so on yep. somebody asked um, how many can there be and, um, and, and and problems with people going in and out of break rooms just have you got a couple of comments on how zoom um, delivers the break room experience? sure um, I, I can't remember what the limit is but it, it, it's it's about this is 50 or 60 or something quite a lot, though, I mean, I mean, oh yeah I mean you've got, you've got your loads and loads of breakout rooms and you, you it's a very flexible tool I mean you can put as many or as few people you want in uh, you can manually allocate people to rooms or you can just get just let zoom just allocate people randomly um, people disappear then you can send a message to a room if you want them to come back if you want to tell them something uh, you there's a countdown when people are told how long is before the room is actually going to be closed again um, as a trainer or as a, you can actually go and visit each room which I did try until I realized that as soon as you actually go and visit a room and actually start to discuss with two or three people what happens is that your whole zoom screen setup completely disappears and you've actually got to reconfigure all your screens again. So if you want to go and you know, visit six rooms and you have to visit them all at once, uh, but you wind up having to reconfigure yourself again. But it's very flexible of the breakout rooms. Uh, you can, and, and, and if what will often happen is that, that you, 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 you allocate, say, you know, 18 people to six rooms, and suddenly you find that you know, two people have, one person has actually lost connection and another one just, for some reason can't join. So one person's left on their own. Uh, so what you can do is you can say to that one person, sorry, you look to be on your own, uh, would you like me to allocate you to another room and you can send them to another room so it's actually incredibly versatile it's really well done is that okay um question there about is your experience limited to training um i guess you do focus on training but basically all of this applies to ad boards it applies to online meetings small what we're talking about is small online meetings um, and, and and everything you said applies to all of those doesn't it uh, I, I, I mean, I think the principles. Uh, I think the principles apply. I think again, it depends on what you're trying to achieve with your particular meeting. Uh, for me, I tried to sort of define it right at the beginning, which is, if you like, the ultimate in trying to mimic the face-to-face. -face. So two-way, even three-way live and as much interaction uh, uh, as possible um, and yes I, I mean that would work with an ad board I mean that's exactly what you want with an ad board is to have full interaction between your, your key opinion leaders and, uh, and everyone else and showing slides and sharing resources and so on. Um, I, I, th I hope that what, what I'm saying now would apply to any 
you know, interactive situation at all. I think all I would say is that the, 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 the there's a security aspect. I mean, obviously, in something like an ad board, that would be a highly secure meeting, and you would need to use all the tools and resources available for for security uh, for, for for obvious commercial reasons. Uh, whereas, you know, when, if we're discussing educational um, uh, a, a education, the sort of things I'm discussing, you know, I, I have nothing to hide here. Uh, you know, so uh, but but principles apply, yeah. Okay, um, and just to, I've got one eye on the clock and we're a little late, so um, just to wrap it up a little bit, um, uh, we're, we're running a webinar today, um, we don't actually know whether people are watching us or not, the truth is we've got 80 people signed in. Uh, when you're running this sort of workshop you're talking about, and everyone hopefully is on video and you're seeing them, um, it's, it's, you know, they're in the room effectively with you, they, you know if they're awake or they're, they're doing something else. Um, I suppose partly my question is, do you find as you're running a workshop that people do get distracted? And the specific question that came in is, do you find they come back after the break? I mean, you know, do, do, you, do you find the problem with people just wandering off and you don't know what's happened to them or not? It's just a little bit of experience from the last... Uh, I no, I mean I I've I mean people do occasionally leave and if they need to go to the loo then that, that's fine and of course it's, it's probably a lot easier to do than face to face. Uh, I I'm pretty impressed with the way people do remain engaged, but um, uh, I, I've not had a problem. And I see other questions, for instance, on um, I mean you, you keep people engaged by having thought out how your program works and and not not you know not talking for any more than you know, sort of maybe five minutes at a time without actually asking some sort of question or getting some sort of interaction. Um, and and, and so, so really it's good preparation that prevents people from uh, perhaps, you know, getting bored, tired and being distracted and leaving. Uh, okay, so, so your experience is they're not, they're not coming and then just disappearing apart from anything else, hanging no. out. No, the, it, it, I've, I've not found that, but again, I hope that's just because of reason be careful uh, preparation and because I, I of course have this eternal fear that you know I'm going to bore people and people aren't going to want to stay here so uh, yeah okay good okay so the work the hard work pays off basically okay look I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up the recorded part of the session now um, and um, to those of you online at the moment please if you don't need to don't rush away because we're happy to stay here till the top of the hour and there are more questions and there's some some good specific questions we'll, we'll cover off there are some good questions yeah there are some good um, questions yeah but, but just for the the purpose of the recording I'd like to say a huge thanks to John for coming along um, and, and, and giving us the benefit of, of a lot of practical experience there. I think it's easy to think this is just you know, easy and it's not. There are lots of things to think about. So thank you very much, John. Um, I know sure. I'm sure that everyone um, who wants to contact you can contact you via LinkedIn. That's the easy way yeah? um, and, and reach out to you that way. So um, anybody that's watching this, um, if, you're, uh, if you, these, these webinars are recorded or being well and, and, and posted on Network Pharma TV, where you'll find lots and lots and lots of videos now, um, you'll find lots more information about what we do at medcomsnetworking.com. So um, it, please do go and have a look and please get engaged uh, with as many of the activities as you, as you want to and as you can. Um, so thank you very much. Everyone stay safe. And just for the moment, I'm going to say goodbye. And again, thank you very much to John. Bye. Pleasure. Cheers.